Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? We'll be starting the next panel in about five minutes, so please come in and take your seats. There's lots of seats down front, and uh, please silence your phones before, you, uh, before we kick this off. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the afternoon panel session titled, What Capabilities Are a Priority for Our Numbered Fleets Today? And What is the Next Big Thing Required to Meet the, meet the Future? This panel discussion should build very nicely from the earlier TICOM panel and the lunch discussion with the budgeteers. It's time to hear now from the fleet commanders and the FMF about what they need to deal with the threats they face today. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Admiral Jamie Fogo, U.S. Navy, retired. Admiral Fogo is no stranger to this audience. He's a career submariner, had command of an SSN, a submarine squadron, a submarine group. He commanded the U.S. Sixth Fleet, U.S. Naval Forces Europe, Africa, and he is now the Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy for the Navy League of the United States. He's also a frequent contributor to Proceedings Magazine. Admiral Fogo, thanks for being the moderator today. Thanks for coming out. Your panel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bill, for that gracious introduction. Thanks to the Naval Institute, our sponsors, and thanks to all of you for uh, being here today. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is introduce our august panel today. And uh, I'm not going to go in order uh, that they sit. I'm just going to call out uh, the first, and maybe my favorite, because he used to work for me, Admiral Dozier Dwyer. Uh, Dozier is the uh, new Second Fleet JFC uh, Norfolk commander. Uh, he is a graduate of California Maritime Academy and uh, the U.S. Naval War College, where he has his master's degree. Uh, F-18 Naval Aviator and uh, a Top Gun. Uh, just a fantastic Naval officer who deployed uh, on eight carriers in the uh, Western Pacific. He commanded VFA-27, uh, a fighter squadron, but he also commanded a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, and I think that's significant because there's not too many officers on active duty that can say they've done that, and what an experience. Um, as a flag officer, he was with me in Bellinopoli as my N5 extraordinaire, and he did a great job in engagement with partners and allies, and there's a lot of that here today. Uh, 3,800 hours in the F-18. The only one that's got more is Admiral Gordon. He's sitting out in the audience there. 1,100 uh, carrier arrested landings, cats and traps on 12 different carriers. So welcome, Dozier Dwyer. Please hold your applause to the end. Uh, the next Admiral Third Fleet Commander, Webb Kaler. Uh, Webb is a native of San Diego, so we made it easy for him. An 86 graduate of the University of Colorado, Bachelor of Science in Physics, very smart guy, Master's in National Security from the Naval War College. He was XO of Vincent, CO of VFA 143, CO of Baton, CO of Ike, and Commander Submarine Group 9. Uh, so this guy's got 3,900 hours of flight time. And uh, frankly, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of hours in an aircraft. But that's only one boomer patrol in the submarine force, for those of you that are comparison. Uh, F-14 and an F-18 pilot. 600 uh, cats and traps, 75 combat missions. Uh, Webb, welcome. Uh, our Coast Guard guest today, uh, absolutely fantastic record, Vice Admiral Mike McAllister. He owns the entire Pacific for the Coast Guard, and what a huge job. He took over on June 30th of 2021 as the operational commander for all Coast Guard missions from uh, Rocky Mountains to the waters off of east, uh, the east coast of Africa. Three tours on board cutters, including two patrol boats, and from 2000 to 2003, he was the guy in charge of uh, Coast Guard operations up and around New York City and uh, New Jersey during the attack on America in 911. And I imagine if you had time to have a beer and talk about that, there's a heck of a lot of stories there, so thanks for being here. He also is an extremely well-educated uh, officer like the rest, but he has a, a master's in business administration from the Sloan School of Management at MIT, one I've been harping on to get the Navy to get back into that program. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks for being here, Mike. Uh, last but not least, Lieutenant General George Smith in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, George, as one MEF commander, commands 47,000 Marines and sailors, uh, the largest Marine expeditionary force out there. Uh, he was commissioned in 85 from the University of North Carolina. He's commanded at every level from platoon to Marine Expeditionary Force, a regional Southwest commander in Helmand, really tough fight, 
in Afghanistan, so this guy's seen some combat along with his Marines, and he's done combat in the Pentagon. He's been there as uh, the J-5 for Director of Plans and Policy, actually, at CENTCOM, and Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of Defense, came over to see me while I was in Naples with the Secretary, and also the G-3 for Marine Corps Operations. So, General Smith, thanks for being here. All right, so that's our panel. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of, of where I see this discussion going today because uh, we're going to talk about uh, priorities and capabilities. Uh, what do these fleet commanders need to fight the fight in the current day, and what are they going to need in the future? What are their priorities, what capabilities they have, and where do we need to go to support them? So it has a lot to do with COPS, current ops, and a lot to do with FOPS, future ops, right? So we want to be able to fight to win, but win without fighting. That's, that's a phrase that my friend Long Aquilino tells me all the time. Uh, it's very important that we have an opportunity uh, to look at the window through their eyes of where we are today in war fighting capabilities and priorities, and then tomorrow, what they need downrange. So we're going to look at challenges and uh, emerging priorities. You, you need only examine the geopolitical situation over the last year. So our national defense strategy currently still in effect, another one coming real soon. I hear it's done and it should be out and hopefully it'll be made public for all of us to look at. But I don't think the adversaries are going to change. China first, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations. So uh, out with the old when my friend Admiral Phil Davidson uh, marched across the brow and left PACOM last year, he made a definitive pr uh, prediction, which in the think tank network in Washington is called the Davidson Gate. That is, the Chinese will move on Taiwan by 2027. In with Admiral Aquilino and Pappy Paparo, and these guys have got their hands full out there. China continues to antagonize Taiwan. Several flights into their furs every time something happens in the uh, a region of geopolitical crises like Ukraine, and they try to put us off balance in the Pacific. Keeps uh, Third Fleet and one map busy. China has 360 warships now to our 300. They're going to have 425 by Congressional Research Service uh, numbers by 2030. China has 1,771 flagged commercial carriers that can be used for dual use in time of war or in time of export-import imbalance, which we have them right now, to our 184 U.S. flagged commercial carriers. Think about how we're going to sustain uh, uh, expeditionary advanced base operations with that small number of ships. We're going to contract it out, and who's it going to go to? Uh, China has made great strides in hypersonics and artificial intelligence. If you hadn't read the report from the National Security Agency on AI with Eric Schmidt and his team, read it. It's really good, and it'll scare you. Uh, on the other side of the world, Second Fleet, Dozier Dwyer is dealing with, he's dual-hatted, the, the third Joint Force Commander for NATO. He's dealing with the fourth battle of the Atlantic right now and Russian aggression in Ukraine in the Baltic and in the Black Sea. If Ukraine spills over into another neighborhood, our president says it could be uh, the beginning of the next world war. And uh, if you're interested, I got a piece in the, in the Hill out today, uh, Art Imitating Life or Life Imitating Art, and it goes back to that great movie with Patrick Swayze in 1984 called Red Dawn. That's Ukraine's Red Dawn right now. Kim Jong-un continues to exacerbate he sends missiles into the Sea of Japan. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, we actually had a ramp freeze because we thought a hypersonic had been launched from North Korea. We shut down traffic here on the west coast of the United States for a temporary pause. Absolutely ridiculous. Middle East, uh, Iran announced the new missile last week that uh, is dual capable to threaten Israel. And I think Jikpoa Light is going nowhere. So lots of challenges and violent extremists after the debacle of the exit from Afghanistan, a lot of ungoverned space out there, and a lot of places and uh, bases for new terrorist organizations to establish themselves. There is some good news, and Admiral Harris talked about that this morning. We have the Quad. The Quad is strong. The leaders have met with Tony Blinken uh, just this past week three times. AUKUS made a big splash last year. The French didn't like it. I believe the French are very important, but it's more than just a nuclear submarine. It should grow. It should grow into something much bigger. I think Harry said 10. I'd be more than happy if it did, and I think these gentlemen would be too. And the last thing I'll tell you, uh, after 120 years, good news, the Navy League of the United States has decided to create a think tank 
I happen to be the inaugural dean, and we're here to advocate for all of these guys and all the maritime services. We have a new logo and a new pin, and everybody has a motto. The Marines have Semper Fi, always faithful. The Coast Guard has Semper Paratus, always ready. Secretary Mavis tried to get the Navy to adopt Semper Fortis, always courageous. I got to have a Semper too. So mine is Semper Invictus, always undefeated. Some of the JOs said, what do you mean, sir? Are you going to go to war with the Billy Mitchell Institute? No, well, not quite. Uh, we have never been defeated as maritime services, and we never will. And these gentlemen are going to tell you how they're going to do it, their priorities and capabilities today. So without any further ado, first question up, gentlemen. In your area of responsibility, and we'll just go in order, uh, what challenges are the most concerned to you and your service? Mike. All right, well, hello, everyone. Um, let me start off with just a little bit of context because um, I find myself um, constantly trying to educate folks on what the Coast Guard's doing. And I'll take a, a, a distinctly Pacific view uh, given my current area of responsibility. But uh, just to give you a sense, um, you know, I think the tri service maritime strategy. Uh, did a, an effective job of describing how the Marine Corps, the Navy, and the Coast Guard work together in integrated form uh, to um, ensure protection of the maritime commons. And we really do work across the full spectrum, cooperation, uh, competition, and conflict. Um, I happen to think that the Coast Guard is a distinct advantage uh, to the United States, particularly in the cooperation and competition realms, and I'll dive into that a little bit. But, uh, but just today, as an example, uh, I have a national security cutter uh, working in uh, Fijian waters, uh, helping uh, Fiji to, uh, to protect, uh, extend their own sovereignty uh, through a ship rider agreement. I've got ships in American Samoa, Federated States of Micronesia. I've got people on the ground doing legal work in Vietnam. I've got a ship off of Ecuador um, protecting fisheries. I've got people on the ground in Malaysia and Philippines. I've got port assessments I'm doing in Japan. And so while your Coast Guard is by far, by far the smallest of the, of the three sea services, uh, we tend to get into a lot, of, uh, a lot of different places. And we have, in, in some respects, unique access because of our uh, unique mission sets, which are, uh, while being prepared uh, to go to sea uh, in times of conflict, we also do things like search and rescue and humanitarian response and protection of fisheries and other resources and so forth. And we have a lot of bi and multilateral agreements which allow us to get into other people's territorial seas and exclusive economic zones, which are fairly unique across government. And, and we enjoy the opportunity to leverage those to advance U.S. security interests. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to play down the crisis and conflict role that we have. We are written into O plans. Um, you mentioned Admiral Gortney. I got to work for Admiral Gortney at NORTHCOM. And uh, you know, I would remind everybody, when things light off overseas, there's always a homeland uh, aspect to that as well. And so we have significant homeland security and homeland duties that, that are uh, first and foremost uh, amongst our priorities when, uh, when conflict erupts, no matter where it is in the world. Um, it was, uh, I think, uh, interesting to us uh, when the Indo-Pacific strategy was released uh, just last Friday night, I believe, um, because it, it articulated, I think, fairly well what the Coast Guard wants to do uh, in the Pacific region and do more of. And in fact, if you look at the action plan uh, to the White House's strategy, the num and, and the, the number one action is driving new resources to the Indo-Pacific, and I'm going to actually just quote uh, it says, we will expand U.S. Coast Guard presence and cooperation in Southeast and South Asia and the Pacific Islands with a focus on advising, training, deployment, and capacity building. Um, much to the chagrin of my, uh, my colleagues here, the U.S. Coast Guard is actually the only U.S. government agency named in the Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, so we'll claim that as success, uh, at least in the Bravo. strategic realm. Uh, but it also says we'll refocus security assistance in the Indo-Pacific, including to build maritime capacity and maritime domain awareness, which is a shared responsibility amongst your sea services. And we will expand the role of people-to-people -people exchange. This is how the Coast Guard gets work done in the Indo-Pacific. And so we're excited to see 
um, that focus in the White House uh, strategy. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll finish out by saying, you know, oftentimes when we think, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, we think uh, Western Pacific, Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean, um, and if there's an opportunity, um, wouldn't mind talking a little bit about uh, the, uh, the rest of the Pacific, the Arctic, uh, the Antarctic, uh, the Eastern Pacific, uh, which is also uh, an area where we continue to provide uh, great focus. Thank you, Mike. Webb, over to you. Hey, sir, thanks. A uh, couple, couple little comments here to start. First, um, I, I wanted to explain uh, for those of you that, that uh, may not know where, how Third Fleet fits uh, when we talk about the warfighting piece and the areas of concern that uh, uh, Admiral Fogo teed up. Uh, so one of the two maneuver arms for Admiral Paparo, uh, Navy maneuver arms, realizing that uh, we got one MEF and three MEF, our naval partners that work with us, but the maneuver arms in the maritime, Third Fleet is one of those, and as this fight kicks off, uh, it is here in San Diego and arguably moves forward in assistance with, uh, uh, with Seventh Fleet. And so when we get to the warfighting side, uh, we need to be real cognizant of that Third Fleet mission set. Additionally, part of Third Fleet, which would traditionally, depending upon uh, your view, has been a force provider uh, and certifier, uh, along with the Airbus, Swobos, and, uh, and Subpac, uh, to then provide forces everywhere. So I do both of those hats here. Uh, in this case, uh, when we talk about the warfighting challenges, I'll, I'll focus my, my efforts on arguably the fight. And uh, for me, and specifically in works with Admiral Paparo and in line with uh, Admiral Thomas at Seventh Fleet, there's a whole bunch of challenges and I could talk about them, um, but I, I, I do wanna mention the word concern that Admiral Fogo brought up because it's a concern only because uh, we concentrate on the things we need to get better at. Uh, I wanna make it pretty clear that I'm pretty confident in the way the Naval Force is. Uh, we have to constantly get better. I have no intention of going to a fair fight. I expect and want to beat them soundly, quickly, uh, and devastatingly, and so it's a concern because I wanna be better. Uh, and I will constantly be better and won't rest. Um, but it is not necessarily um, a huge, it's a weakness which can be um, brought up, I think, a lot. And I'm not, I don't stand for it. Uh, the other piece is, is that on the fighter side of life, uh, we concentrate on goods and others in a debrief. And uh, we spend a little bit of time on the goods and we spend a whole lot of time on the others. And I think that's really important because that's how we get better. Uh, so in that light, what I'll concentrate on real quick here is a couple things. Uh, the first in the warfighting side uh, is long-range fires. And I take long, and, and I think that's one of our largest challenges, to get after the specific tactical level of work that a, that a fleet commander at the tactical arm for Admiral Paparo is. And those long-range fires, we have to continually morph and get better on all, on that entire, entire kill chain find, fix, track, target, engage, and then I'll bring up the word assess. Uh, we all get liquored up on uh, the first portion, and correctly so. Uh, we have got to be able to do this from multi-axis, multi-domain, uh, and put force and power and mass those fires specifically at the target of our choosing when we want. I would also add that one of the challenges we have to continue to work on is the assess piece. If you're gonna take advantage of those fires, those generate maneuver. And maneuver then gets inside of OODA loop uh, and decision cycles for, uh, for the enemy. And for me, uh, we have to work this assess piece uh, very carefully. What it enables us to do is take advantage of the maneuver and reduce the risk. You can always shoot, the, shoot those fires, work the long range kill chain, and make your movement on the expectation that it worked. I would tell you, that the assessment enables us to take some pretty strong look uh, and reduce some of that risk and take, advantage of, uh, and take advantage of those fires to enable that maneuver to further get fires uh, and, and destroy the enemy in the end. Uh, and that's my expectation. So when I look at, the, at the, the most concern, it's that entire kill chain, and that's a big answer on all of those specific elements, um, finding and fixing actual working the targeting piece, uh, and then getting to massing of fires from multi-domain and multi-axis at the time and place of our choosing. Sounds great, 
that challenge and that continued um, improvement to ensure we can increase the range, increase the frequency, um, and ultimately then increase the impact uh, is where, is where I, I think is probably the largest uh, challenge that I continue to work on. And then tied in specifically with that is the training that goes along to it. Because we can spend a whole lot of time thinking about it, and we've got to get every young sailor uh, and every air crew and every submariner and every surface ship captain, everybody in line, and have the ability to operate that complexity uh, specifically in a nominally distributed manner, certainly in a comms limited environment to ensure we can uh, execute those kill chains um, on a routine basis, again, when we'd like. So, um, so there's a whole lot of pieces in there, and I'll, uh, I'll stop there and take any questions when it comes. Webb, thank you very much. I can't resist. So, a really great dialogue there before we go on to Dozier. But uh, you said a couple of things, and you're right. Uh, the concern about capacity is a big concern in the Navy, so numbers, and the Chinese being at 360 and going up above that while we hover at 300 to 305. Uh, but to your point, I, I ran into Doug Small outside here, and we've all tried to help him with uh, getting inside the enemy's OODA loop and decision advantage, and if we can figure that out and make that happen, as you said you were doing in Third Fleet, I think that's really value added and makes us a more effective and bigger fighting force. It increases our size, it's a force multiplier. So thanks for that. And it, it reminds me, most people that know me know that one of my favorite books on strategy is Lawrence Friedman, A History of Strategy. It's like this thick, but he says, you don't have to have ends, ways, and means. You can do what surface uh, warriors call shoot, look, shoot doctrine. You can engage, stop, assess, take advantage of your fires, and then engage again or not. So thanks very much for that. Dozier, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Admiral, and, uh, and, and also like to thank you for that very kind introduction. I didn't know I was your favorite. Um, I'll have to check my fit reps because I don't remember reading that in any of my fit reps, which uh, I think many friends and mentors I see out here in the crowd will probably agree that I was probably not their favorite, or at least it didn't appear in the fit rep that they wrote on me. But great to be here at West, uh, great to get out of uh, Norfolk and get back to San Diego and, and interact with so many colleagues, and as I said, mentors and friends, and to be with you to share you know, my thoughts on how we are postured and looking at uh, the, the potential uh, conflict that could arise in the Atlantic in the future. And much like my colleagues up here, I'd like to set the stage in a little bit of context. And as many of you are tracking in 2011, the U.S. Second Fleet was disestablished. Uh, we were engaged in largely expeditionary operations uh, way, uh, well beyond our shores. Uh, there wasn't much of a threat in the Atlantic, and it was decided to focus the resources uh, and uh, disestablish Second Fleet and place those resources elsewhere. After 2014, in the illegal annex of the Crimean Peninsula, uh, as many of you are tracking, we saw an uptick of uh, Russian Navy uh, submarine out-of-area deployers, which culminated in uh, Russian general-purpose submarines off the east coast of the United States. And it was determined at that point that the Atlantic uh, no longer provided that geography uh, that enabled our protection and that standoff that we've enjoyed for so many decades. And, uh, and it was established due to that now persistent proximate threat that nuclear-powered Russian submarines with a land attack capability posed to the defense of our homeland, that it was time to stand up another operational command in Norfolk, Virginia, and reestablish a U.S. Second Fleet that was established in 2018 under my predecessor. And in that time, uh, and, and it was, you know, I think many of us that have been part of large organizations, uh, you know, we, we kind of inherit the bureaucracy that comes with those organizations, and, and we often like to go back and, and, and redesign and rebuild that organization fit to fight, fit to operate. And that's really what that, uh, those that came before me did with the U.S. Second Fleet. They reimagined the Second Fleet, and the Second Fleet today is much different than my partner Webb here in the U.S. Third Fleet in that I am solely focused on operations. Uh, I am not in the maintenance and basic phase business. Uh, units uh, and ships are assigned to me 
largely trained, largely manned, largely ready to fight so I can focus on war fighting and defense of the homeland across the Atlantic. And that is my mission set, uh, maritime homeland defense, working for NAB North, Admiral Cottle, and as Admiral Kaler uh, Webb stated, I am also a maneuver arm. I support NAV North. I also support Admiral Burke as NAV Ur as the second fleet commander available to him to see to naval forces uh, throughout the Atlantic. And as many of you are tracking uh, on paper, uh, my AOR is from Puerto Rico to the North Pole out to 45 west longitude. And, in, and many of the war fighters I see out here in the crowd know that in time of conflict, we're not going to worry about lines on a map. We're going, to learn, we're going to worry about speed, agility, violence, and be able to maneuver our forces independently of lines of maps to bring force to bear on our adversaries. And so with that, as a U.S. Second Fleet, we are focused on an integrated approach, multi-domain, cyber, space, obviously undersea, as well as air and maritime to conduct our mission. And because we're such a lean headquarters, we need to focus on interoperability, not only with the joint force, but with our allies and partners. And I'm glad to see Admiral McAllister up here, my counterpart on the East Coast, uh, Admiral Poulin, who's the Atlantic Area Commander as Coast Guard, uh, with the U.S. Coast Guard, and Admiral Centarpia, who is the Atlantic Canadian Commander. The three of us have established a tri-party relationship to ensure that we bring all forces in the maritime to bear to provide defense to the homeland. So that's as I see it uh, for the U.S. Second Fleet. And I look forward to your questions as we go out throughout the afternoon. Thank you, Admiral. Hey, thanks, Dozier. And uh, thanks for the uh, head nod to the United States Coast Guard. I mean, as uh, NAV Ewer, uh, I got so much mileage out of my relationship with Commandant uh, Schultz. Uh, he would send me cutters, and they would deploy to the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa for six months doing absolutely amazing things. And uh, so thanks to the Coast Guard for being force multipliers for the rest of the team here, even though they come under a different department. Uh, United States Marine Corps, General Smith, over to you, sir. Admiral Fogo, thank you, sir, for the uh, introduction, and it's, uh, it's great to be with you all this afternoon. Um, my, uh, my battle buddy, when talking about the uh, challenges and concerns, my battle buddy, Webb Kaler, um, mentioned long-range precision fires and kill chains, and I would add to that uh, sensing and making sense of the environment and um, preserving the ability to command and control in, in contested uh, information environments. Lots of, lots of work going on across the joint force uh, in those areas that you're all well aware of. All very, very important. Uh, but when I focus on a particular concern, um, I would offer that we're not placing enough emphasis on logistics, um, and particularly logistics in a distributed and contested uh, maritime uh, environment. And I say that because it's hard to exercise. exercise norm exercises normally aren't long enough to truly exercise and, and pressure test logistics, if you will. Uh, in the war games that I've participated in, far too often forces are where they ideally would like to be with a whole bunch of sustainment piled up, and the war games don't last long enough to test logistics. But I think uh, logistics is undoubtedly the pacing function when we talk about uh, operations in the Pacific. When you look at the vast expanse of the Pacific and all the attendant challenges, logistics uh, is going to be that pacing function. And so as one MEF looks to um, shift into the Pacific and get west of the IDL, um, our logistics team is looking really hard at updating and developing um, logistics nodes and, and distribution sites uh, and looking at whole new prepositioning uh, constructs um, for the MEF uh, so that we can seamlessly and effectively transition from competition, steady state campaigning, uh, to conflict. Uh, because again, without the logistics, without that sustainment, 
uh, we will not be able to do that. And it must nest within, obviously, Indo-PACOM's larger uh, logistics posture. And I would add uh, that we're working hard to reduce um, what is already a strain on uh, transcom uh, capacity uh, and what the uh, expectations of the joint force are in that regard. We're also looking um, at how do we bridge um, the gap, if you will, of theater to operational to tactical logistics, um, often referred to as the, as the last tactical mile. Um, our logisticians are fond of describing it as the last logistical mile, um, and that's a challenge in and of itself. Uh, we're excited uh, later this year to team with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab uh, to bring a stern landing vessel uh, out here to the West Coast to exercise that as part of closing that last uh, tactical mile, that last logistical mile. Um, that's going to help us in our, in our future operating uh, concepts um, to deliver that logistics to the warfighter uh, in these distributed locations. So lots of work going on here, but I would offer on the logistics front with what I describe as the pacing challenge, the pacing function, um, lots more work to be done. Thank you. George, thanks very much. And also, thank you for mentioning logistics, something I've harped on a lot, uh, you know, after the big Trident Juncture exercise. One thing we learned was logistics was the sixth domain of warfare. And after I said that, General Scaparotti called me up and he goes, why do you say that? That's not true. And I said, well, we don't really have a good joint definition for domain, sir, and NATO was late to embrace cyber and space, so why not? NATO actually has a definition for logistics, and it is something that enables warfighting in all of the other domains. And if you think about it, that's a pretty good definition. And I do believe that logistics is a sixth domain. And the things you've been doing out in the Pacific, I've been following you with your exercises and some of the stuff with the unmanned uh, surface vessels and get them out to the islands, absolutely fantastic. Force multiplier for us. Okay, second question. Uh, gentlemen. Uh, there's a new global posture review out, but we all wait with bated breath to see uh, the final uh, version of the national defense strategy. And uh, the hint is, uh, no surprise, that China is the pacing threat, and there will be yet again another pivot to the Pacific. And while I was in the Pentagon working for Admiral Greenard when he was CNO, people would ask him all the time about what is the definition of pivot? And he would tell me, well, if you ever get asked that question, Tell them pivot is past CPA and opening, something we did back in 2014 and 15. Sixty percent of the fleet out to the Pacific, 40 percent everywhere else. So we're not going back and doing that again. We may very well do that again. And this question really resonates, I think, with our second fleet commander now, because is it wise to pivot to the Pacific one more time in light of what Russia is doing in Ukraine and the threats to Europe in the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, the High North, the Baltic, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll throw that out, and uh, we'll see what our Coast Guard officer has to say first about that. Over to you. Yeah, well, thanks, sir. And uh, so I'm going to uh, add to your, you know, you started off talking about the, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, shipbuilding effort and so forth. The Chinese also have by far the largest uh, Coast Guard in the world. Yeah. Uh, they passed the U.S. Coast Guard about two years ago. Uh, they're more than twice our size now. And, uh, and they don't use their Coast Guard uh, for, for the common good. Uh, they use the, their Coast Guard to advance the CCP's strategic objectives. And, uh, and we see that often in the form of uh, gray zone activities. Um, so to answer your question, I, I do think that the, the Pacific remains an area of significant international and national consequence. And, uh, and, and we in the Coast Guard are very serious about moving capability or adding capacity uh, to be able to have a greater presence uh, in the Pacific. Uh, those of you who attended lunch probably heard our uh, Chief of uh, Resources uh, talk a little bit about how uh, Congress and the administration has been helpful to the Coast Guard in building out new capacity uh, national security cutters, our, our offshore patrol cutters, the first four come to the Pacific area, fast response cutters, polar security cutters. All of that can't come fast enough uh, for us to be able to really have uh, the uh, type of effect uh, that we'd like to 
uh, in the uh, in the Pacific area. Hey, thanks. Absolutely important too to note that uh, of all the services, the Coast Guard is really the only one that has a direct dialogue with the Russians or the Chinese throughout all these ups and downs and crises and actions like Ukraine or you know, runs on the Straits of Taiwan. So it's absolutely amazing. And the Chinese actually told me a few years ago, they like the U.S. Coast Guard. That's why they painted their ships to look like yours. <laughs> All right, Webb, over to you. Hey, sir, a couple comments on uh, on this one. With obviously a bias in Third Fleet, and I'm, I'm in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and my last couple jobs were uh, embroiled in the Indo-Pacific as well. Um, I, I would just say in light of the couple comments that you brought up, first of all, uh, the, the threats within the MDS, and we haven't seen the new one, but I'd expect it will be the five, and four of those do reside in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I Good think in the, in the pacing thread, as it's been listed, uh, at least in previous NDS with, uh, with the PRC, I think it's important uh, to realize that, and to realize that the Indo-Pacific, uh, I'm not telling anybody in this audience anything they don't know, but that you know it's from nominally the coast of California to India, uh, and it's all the way uh, north to south poles. Um, and that tyranny of distance is really important. Uh, the PRC and the pacing threat does not have that tyranny of distance in their regional, uh, their regional um, aims. And so uh, the ability to um, be present in competition is, is needed, I think, and really important. If you're going to compete, you got to be on the court. And uh, if we aren't in the backyard, it's like playing a basketball game five on three, you're at a disadvantage. And so my personal opinion is the pivot to the, to the Pacific is correct. Um, I think the force structure forward is deterrent, um, it has a deterrent effect. Uh, it has, because of its ability to respond, and it enables us to compete in the large area uh, that the Indo-Pacific, um, certainly uh, west of the international dateline even in, in that light has. Uh, I would caveat that also with that pivot to the Pacific is, uh, um, in my opinion, correct. Uh, the thing and the best part of the naval forces is they are movable. And so pivot to the Pacific does not mean that they are embroiled or stuck there, uh, but they are then able to maneuver and move to uh, areas that, uh, that require it at the time. So that'd be my comment. Sir. Thanks, Webb. Yeah, and if he's out there somewhere, a uh, native of San Diego, our friend Admiral Nasso Swift, would say, yeah, the beauty of naval forces is our ability to swing from theater to theater to theater. Argue, you could argue about how much time it takes, but a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier can get to theater uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, so we have two out in the Pacific, and we have another one in the Eastern Med that just finished up uh, Neptune uh, 22 uh, deterrence uh, exercise against the Russians. So thanks, I agree with you. Dozier, over to you. What do you think? You're the European guy. Yeah, you know, I'd love to keep everything in my Atlantic waters, and there you go. Uh, but I'm a realist, and I, I also understand the priorities. And you know, something that Webb was saying reminds me of, you know, uh, you know, right out of the CNO's NAV plan that that you know, U.S. naval forces will de will deploy with the joint force alongside our allies and partners to conduct our maritime business anywhere, anytime, uh, to ensure you know freedom of navigation and, and an open and free maritime environment. Uh, so that is our job. It's not parochial, it's not isolated to regions. Uh, when we train and certify our deploying carrier strike groups, our amphibious radio groups, and our submarine forces, it's for a worldwide deployment. And that's what's unique and great about the United States Navy, is we, when we are trained and certified, we are trained and certified for all missions, anywhere, anytime. And as I walk the waterfront and talk with the ready rooms and the wardrooms, the chief's mess and the crew messes, uh, uh, you know, they're, in their mindset, it's we're based in Norfolk and we're going to be deploying to the Mediterranean. And the message I have for, for those various audiences is, you know, you pack your sea bags and when you push away from the pier, uh, be ready to deploy uh, around the world to face any any conflict, any crisis, because that's what we do in the United States Navy. Uh, I know as the U.S. Second Fleet, uh, I enable the U.S. Third Fleet and the U.S. Seventh Fleet for their operations when they find themselves in conflict and crisis. Just like Webb, when you train your forces, uh, you train them to support uh, NAVIR or NAVNORTH if the crisis or conflict uh, arises in the Mediterranean or the North Atlantic. 
uh, Harry S. Truman, who we just uh, deployed and certified last fall uh, during her uh, COM2X exercise, she ran the gamut of training scenarios that, that covered all problem sets, not just the big two, but the two plus three. And when she sailed, uh, there's full anticipation that she was gonna go somewhere else, and today she is operating in the Mediterranean based on where uh, the department needs her most. So, uh, you know, though I'd like to keep them all in the Atlantic under the second fleet control, I, I understand that uh, we are a global Navy and we are trained to carry out any mission anywhere at any time. All right, George, from the Globe and Anchor, what do you think? So I would, uh, I would simply tell you that uh, one MEF uh, since 9-11 has been largely focused in the CENTCOM AOR. Um, it has been uh, just a, a constant pull of, of one more of, of one map forces and capabilities into uh, into the central region, uh, and it's only been in the last year, 18 months, uh, that we've been able to conduct this pivot. I wouldn't classify it as a second pivot. It's probably a, an initial pivot for one map um, to get into the Indo Pac and to and to exercise. Um, as a part of the team, as a part of the joint force there. And ideally, what we're looking to do is to provide Admiral Paparo a second Marine Expeditionary Force, uh, along with three MEF uh, out in Japan, um, that supports the fleet's maneuver. So I see my task is very simple. I support Admiral Kaler's maneuver uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And so we've been uh, focused mightily on that. And you, you hear a, of a bunch of discrete capabilities as part of force design, uh, but make no mistake, um, I focus intently on Marine Air Ground Task Force warfighting um, in the Indo-Pacific in support of the fleet commander. And uh, that's, um, you know, the best example of that I can give you is we're getting ready to assume uh, the responsibilities for the MAGTAF deployment down to Aust Darwin, Australia here in the next couple months, and we see that as a tremendous opportunity uh, to increase our footprint, one MEF's footprint, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we continue to explore any and all opportunities uh, to get west of the IDL. And again, I mentioned the logistical challenges associated with that, so we're working very hard on that front. It's important to do that, um, to provide that, to, to provide that deterrence, to add to that deterrence value to the joint force, and also to reassure our partners and allies uh, in the Western Pacific. And one of the things we're looking to do is to put a spotlight on those malign actions of, our, of the pacing threat, in particular, our, our principal adversary out there. And I had the good fortune of working on um, the tri-service maritime strategy that Mike McAllister uh, highlighted in his comments while I was back in the uh, Pentagon as our operations deputy. And I saw the importance of the Naval Service, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard working together, leveraging various capabilities, and in the case of a Coast Guard, leveraging their unique authorities to conduct that deterrence by detection, if you will, to put that spotlight uh, on those malign activities and, and really stop them in their tracks. So one MEF is working hard uh, to be part of that overall deterrence calculus. George, thank you. Uh, let's move on to uh, something that you heard about. I haven't uh, read a lot about the results. Maybe you guys can shed some light on it. The large scale exercise from 2020. Now this was originally planned to go down in 2019. Uh, I was part of it with Admiral Grady and Admiral Aquilino, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it was delayed for COVID, and I retired before we actually pulled the trigger and did the exercise. Admiral Gordon, he's out here in the audience. He and Admiral Swift were part of this XCOM for the exercise, and sir, I think it was the largest XCOM ever, and kudos to you for that, because every major exercise I ran in Europe didn't have enough people in the red cell or the XCOM, and it stalled, or you exhausted them, and the inputs were weak. So this one, you had lots of folks in excess of 1,000 trying to help our warfighters get through what would be a real campaign, some virtual, but some real. Virtual carriers, real carriers. Okay, so uh, the one thing I, I want you to work in the answer uh, on how it went for you, maybe some lessons learned, whatever you can talk about 
in the unclassed domain is also the fact that I don't think there were any allies and partners in this. And I think there's a place for them in the future, particularly if we're going to walk the walk of the talk about AUKUS and the Quad. Uh, so opinions and lessons learned on large-scale exercise. Mike, were you involved in that? I had the uh, opportunity to go to uh, Global 14, uh, Webb and, uh, and his broader team uh, were kind enough to host me out there. So, uh, so yeah, I have a little bit of insight, um, but let me pivot just a little bit. My, uh, for me, this was kind of the uh, actualization, the implementation of uh, integrated deterrence. And so let me just uh, share with you some of my insights on that. When we talk integrated deterrence, we seem to generally focus on across domains, sea, air, land, cyber, space, and so forth. Um, Admiral, you just mentioned the need to integrate across uh, and with international partners, and, uh, and we certainly uh, uh, concur with that. Um, but also there's the need for integration across the whole of government, and I think this is probably an area that, that bears the most potential. And by that I mean you know, the diplomatic information, military, economic, Getting, getting all of U.S. power and international power kind of focused in the same direction. And I don't think we've quite uh, got there yet. So let me give you one, one example. It's kind of a, a Coast Guard flavor example. And I know Ross Myers was originally going to be here and, and understandably had to cancel. But uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a cyber example where integration is important. We, the Coast Guard, are integrated into U.S. Cyber Command for military-focused cyber capability. We work with CISA uh, very closely to build out cyber operations capabilities for the Department of Homeland Security. Think critical infrastructure protection from a, a homeland defense perspective. And we're the sector lead for the U.S. in maritime cyber uh, security. So we have relationships with uh, uh, ports authorities, with uh, private industries, maritime industries, and we're now being approached by a lot of our international partners who, from a trade perspective, are interested in joining efforts from a cyber protection standpoint. Cyber is not as effective if you take kind of a military-only stand, you know, viewpoint. If you really can integrate across the whole of government and with your international partners, uh, you're really able to, uh, frankly, uh, you know, leapfrog uh, in, into um, uh, combined effects uh, much more than uh, if you go it alone. Perfect, thanks. And you know, one thing I'll add, many of you know this, uh, some of you might not, is probably the greatest example of Coast Guard leading whole of government is the Joint Interagency Task Force, Giant of South, uh, down in Key West, that's doing counter drug and illicit trafficking in this country. And it's an example for all the other COCOMs, and many have picked up on that. Webb, on, on uh, large-scale exercise, seven time zones, over 25,000 personnel. How'd it work for you? Yes, sir. So, uh, again, I was a tactical arm as part of that, and, uh, and I worked then for, obviously, one of the NCCs. Uh, had the opportunity to be involved in those VTCs as well. What we saw was integration across the NCCs and realizing it was um, a, you know, Navy-specific, naval, I would say, in that regard, uh, and we didn't have a huge, certainly, uh, combined sense. Uh, and the joint was at the tactical level. Um, and so I think that's somewhere we probably go later. Uh, but I would tell you from, a, from the tactical side down at the fleet, uh, we had a couple things that we wanted to uh, do, and I think we got to test. One was that the integration across the NCCs uh, enabled the fleet commanders, the numbered fleet commanders, to, to work across the seams. It was, uh, and read for me, uh, seventh and fifth, uh, seventh and third, and then for Admiral Thomas not to speak for him, but he then could synchronize with fifth on the other side. And those then prevented some sort of seamless transitions of things that we needed to, to do. Uh, and the fact that that was coordinated at the NCC level empowered the, the numbered fleet commanders to be able to do that. So that was one piece that I took away and one, and one that I wanted to uh, continue to work with Admiral Thomas. Um, to uh, Dozer's point, uh, when the fight begins, it's not lines on a map, and we will work uh, as best as that uh, the tactical situation requires um, to generate uh, combat power when it has to happen, and we were able to do that. Uh, the second thing for uh, Third Fleet was uh, to be able to command and control in an expeditionary sense. And that sounds a little bit like, what, you know, what are you talking about? Well, 
Third Fleet doesn't have a flagship anymore. It doesn't mean I won't abscond with one if I can't, if I uh, need to, but that comes at the expense of then a ship uh, that may be needed for either amphibious operations or what have you. Um, so for us, uh, I do think that at some point uh, when the fight happens forward, I need to be closer to the time zone. Um, I think I need to be able to sense the battlefield as, as locally as possible. What we set up in uh, large-scale exercises then was an expeditionary mock, um, you know, in, the, in, in George's uh, lexicon, in a tent. Uh, and can you command and control the fleet from an expeditionary standpoint, both for the equipment and the C2 requirements, and then the actual staff ability? Uh, and we were able to do that um, both in the large-scale exercise and we C2 the rest of Third Fleet writ large from there. And then the final thing that large-scale exercise provided us, uh, and this was a tactical experiment specifically, was in the SYNCX that we did off the coast of Hawaii. Uh, and poor USS, ex-USS Ingraham's at the bottom of the ocean now uh, due to some really good work across uh, the joint force. And we were able to provide uh, synchronized time and place of our choosing fires from the Marines, um, ground-based fi uh, maritime fires from the Marines, uh, MLRS fires from the, uh, from the Army that actually was a shipboard shot. Uh, the Navy provided uh, air, surface, and submarine fires into this Hulk. I forgot the Marines also provided air uh, fires. And the Air Force uh, planned on, uh, and there was some last-minute uh, maintenance problems, but it was going to be uh, air, um, long-range, very long-range, CONUS-based uh, fires. And so that joint synchronization of nominal long-range fires from the full joint side uh, and multi-domain, which ended up being multi-axis, gave us some really good opportunity there. Excellent. Thanks very much, Webb. Dozier? Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and, you know, just as Webb was saying, uh, it was a great exercise, and, and we realized and learned very similar uh, uh, aspects out of that. At the tactical level, as Webb was saying, you know, we realized at Second Fleet that we need to be forward at the point of need to provide effective command and control of maritime forces, not just naval forces, but maritime forces, as well as a joint force who's uh, supporting us. You know, at, at Second Fleet, if I'm commanding and controlling maritime forces in the North Atlantic, that is you know, five to six time zones uh, ahead as well. So it's, it is a, you know, not as vast as the Pacific, but it's still a, a vast uh, uh, area to command and control from Norfolk uh, where forces are operating in the high north. So we, we came to the realization early that that expeditionary capability is required. And, and, and like Third Fleet, Second Fleet does not have its own command ship. So, so we're talking tents, we're talking forward. And the Second Fleet exercised that during large-scale exercise with a, with a small group of, of 50 sailors and Marines forward working out of tents, uh, working out of uh, cruise boxes to set up their, uh, their C2 systems. At an operational level, uh, much like what Webb was saying, uh, LSC really drove home the point that you know, lines on maps uh, don't really matter. Uh, as the maneuver arm for NAV North and NAV Ur, working with the U.S. Sex Fleet under, uh, under NAV Ur, uh, it's, it's incredibly important that we have good maritime operations center to maritime operations center or mock to mock coordination uh, to ensure that we bring effects to bear with, with that speed and agility required for a future fight. As well as that mock to mock coordination in the Pacific, because the, the the potential adversary or future adversary that I'll face in the Atlantic and the High North could very well be the same adversary that Webb and KT are facing at Third Fleet and Seventh Fleet. So the effects that I bring in the Atlantic need to be coordinated with the effects uh, that uh, are being brought to bear in the Pacific because the adversary sees us as one, one joint force. Uh, they don't see us as separated by by two different oceans. So those effects have to be coordinated. I, I think that was one of the true valuable insights that LSC brought out was, was that required uh, global mock to mock coordination is required in, in any future fight. Terrific. Thanks. George? Well, first of all, Webb, thanks for highlighting 1MEF's uh, participation in the SYNCX. 
Um, we learned a lot there. But what I really want to focus on is how we took some of the lessons from LSE and drove it down to the uh, Echelon 4 level, if you will, during our recent exercise, Steel Night, uh, just this past December off the uh, Southern California coast here. Uh, and it really um, was impressive, the, the level of initiative and innovation um, by Marines and sailors to get at uh, Naval Expeditionary Command and Control, which Dozer highlighted uh, in his comments. And, and really, I would, I would highlight the work of, of uh, Major General Roger Turner, the Commanding General of the 1st Marine Division, uh, who's in the audience here today. And I don't know if uh, Rear Admiral Mouse Bays is here as well. But the teamwork between 1st Marine Division and ESG-3 was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and then you mix in um, kind of the, inno the innovation of, of uh, Colonel Beef Winters here from our uh, Marine Air Control Group, who really kind of widened his aperture beyond aviation command and control and looked at, you know, Naval Expeditionary Command and Control and how do we get after this. Um, all, of, all of those uh, Marines and sailors contributed to tremendous learning on um, working through the details of communications networks, information flow, target acquisition, and ultimately target prosecution. So this went leaps and bounds beyond simply integrated, integrating Navy uh, sailors and Marines uh, within a maritime operations center. That's important, and they did that, but they went well uh, beyond that. Um, and I personally um, watched more than a dozen times how this team was able to seamless, seamlessly pass uh, command and control back and forth between a Navy commander afloat and a Marine commander ashore in prosecuting maritime targets. Um, and so um, this was uh, really singularly impressive. A lot of it was driven by what we learned in uh, the large-scale exercise but really driven down to kind of where the rubber meets the road at the task group and even the task unit levels, uh, and we have much to build on. And I would, I would add, finally, that the team did all of this with capabilities that we have today, save some precision uh, fires capabilities that's on the horizon. George, thanks very much. I know we want to get to audience questions, but uh, we're going to do a last question, rapid fire from the team here on DMO, Distributed Maritime Operations. So when uh, Sino Gilday came on board, had his change of command, uh, had his party at the Navy Museum and went home that night, the next morning his first meeting was with his four stars. So that was myself, Admiral, uh, Admiral Grady, and Admiral Aquilino. And after we welcomed him to his own boardroom, I asked him the first question. Sino, is it war fighting first? He didn't hesitate, absolutely. Now that's not a dumb question because some CNOs have different perspectives. That was Admiral Greenwich's perspective. Admiral Mullen believed in uh, deterring first, deterrence of major power war, and if you had to fight the war, you were ready and you fought it. It's all how you, pre you, you present yourself to the Hill. So then Admiral Gilday said, from where I sat on the Joint Staff as director of the Joint Staff, uh, I think you guys are all on board with distributed maritime operations, and our heads went up and down. So, gentlemen, 30 seconds apiece. Uh, how is DMO working in your AORs? And, uh, Mike, you want to take a bite on this or you uh, want to take uh, a bite on it? Uh, uh, Coast Guard does distributed maritime operations every day. Um, maybe, maybe, we, we, uh, maybe, maybe we'll copyright the idea, but... Uh, I think, you know, a higher level, this is really about creating integrated effects, you know, across distributed operations. And um, to your point, sir, I, you know, there's the, the conflict war fight, but there's also the activities that lead to that, the competition and cooperation. And I do think that there's opportunities for us, as I think about, as an example, Chinese gray zone activity and countering that in an, in an integrated effect uh, form. Uh, we could be fully, we could be fully successful in integrated deterrence from a military perspective, and China could still march its way across the Pacific, into South America, and all around the globe. Um, and so, we really do need to focus below the level of conflict today in order to uh, to stem that. Thank you.
Webb. Uh, I'll go quickly. Um, I've talked a lot about long-range fires, multi-axis, multi-domain, and that's the heart of DMO. When you mass those fires in a specific spot, you're getting to the power of that. But you've got to be able to do that or distribute it, and we're not able. And in the end, massing those fires when that commander needs it uh, is the whole piece of that. And I think we're I think we're moving to a very good capability there. Of note is that requirement is that those commanders at whatever level need to have assigned battle space for which they can operate in. And to be able to do that, you gotta be able to sense it, uh, you gotta have the authorities to operate in it, and you gotta be able to see two in it. And if you can do that, uh, I think, and talking with my boss, he will delegate that to me. And then I will operate in that in a distributed fanner, manner, which means I can see two, I can sense it, and then my uh, mission command will enable those um, tactical units to then operate and mass those fires. If I can delegate it further, I will then, if those units can sense, have the authorities to do it and see to it, I'll delegate it further and we'll have the ability to mass those fires. C2, very important, thank you. Dozier. I absolutely agree 100% with what Webb is saying and, and, I'll, and, and I'll take it one step further what we're looking at in Norfolk, it's, it's that integration of allies and partners. Uh, because, you know, they truly, especially in the Atlantic area, and, and you, Webb, you would say the same in the Pacific, it's, it's having our allies and partners with us every step of the way to bring their unique capabilities, their unique insights to the, the, the area, to the geography, uh, to the, you know, historical significance. Uh, and then it really gets back to our information sharing. You know, what is the releasability of some of our intelligence? Can we develop tear lines that we can release to not only 5i, but also to, re, uh, to our NATO partners to enable that information sharing across the alliance. And I think that's really critical to really get taking uh, distributed maritime operations to the next level because there are, there are navies that uh, have unique capabilities, exquisite capabilities in areas that we don't often find ourselves. Uh, so I think that's kind of really where we take the next level of, of DMO is, is through allies and partners. Thanks. Great thoughts. George, over to you. Last comment. Yeah, this is all about uh, generating the uh, virtues of mass without the vulnerabilities of concentration. And for the Marine Corps, uh, that's accomplished by our stand-in forces, uh, which are optimized uh, to operate in close and confined seas uh, in defiance of our adversaries' long-range precision standoff capabilities and sensing capabilities. This is all about supporting fleet maneuver for Marine forces and the broader sea control fight. Fantastic, all right. Uh, now it's over to you, audience. Uh, there's not a question that you can ask that will stump this incredible <laughs> crowd. So take it away, we've got mics. I don't like that joke. And we'll try to be uh, as judicious as possible. Thanks, sir. Um, DMO counts on information warfare officers. How do you think on your staff, from operational to tactical, we're doing it getting those people integrated and how are they doing and what do you need more of? Uh, I'll, I'll take a swing at that. First of all, I, I agree with you. If I'm massing effects, um, it comes from all levels, right? And so space, cyber, and the like. Uh, I think the training of that gets very difficult um, to be able to do that. Um, and so that's one of the challenges we have as we integrate the IW world into that. Uh, I personally think that as we've worked through the IWC construct at the strike group level, and now it's building out to IW in the MOC, uh, and that's both at the numbered fleet at the NCCs, uh, that we're generating um, the needs and the, the, real, the reality that it's um, a supporting, supported relationship depending upon what phase of that fight you're in in, the, in, the, in these fires, right? And so I think we're making pretty good strides in it, to be perfectly honest. And, and I wish uh, Admiral Myers could be here, but I certainly understand why he can, our 10th Fleet Commander. And what he would say uh, is that, you know, this is an area that he's working very hard on. He also has his own Maritime Operations Center. And instead of building this exquisite capability in each of the number of fleet headquarters, he's taken upon himself to integrate his Maritime Operations Center with each of ours. And so he has that resident expertise up at Fort Meade, uh, attached to the cryptological network, so he can provide us with those IW fires that are critical at the, the maritime mock level. I, I would offer from the Marine Corps, 
Um, I have, as do the other two Marine Expeditionary Forces, a MEF information group within my command. Uh, Headquarters, Marine Corps, Headquarters Marine Corps also has an information department led by a three-star deputy commandant, Lieutenant General Jerry Glavy, who's in the audience here today. So we clearly recognize the importance of operations in the information environment. Sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for your time today. My question is for Third Fleet. Earlier in the week, as mentioned, er, you had the Vincent just come back from a deployment, and it was mentioned that there was a lot of first or some new lessons learned with the future air wing. I was wondering if you could kind of expand a little bit on that and what kind of capabilities that that deployment is illustrating that you need more of or maybe new capabilities that you don't have that you wish you had to really bring it together in the future. Well, thanks for the question. I, I would tell you there's a lot of lessons we're still building. That's the first caveat I would give you. That being said, uh, you know, you put fifth generation uh, in a strike group level capability uh, along with increased growler support, uh, which is what we had, and then uh, a now new way of working logistics through CMV-22s, which generated a whole different way for which we can do that. Read um, any airfield you can land at. I don't necessarily need 8,000 feet of runway. Uh, logistics at night, those particular things are, uh, uh, are really important. And um, I think there's, there's more for us to determine now on numbers and fifth gen uh, fighters as they integrate with fourth gen and growler, uh, uh, the growler integration. And uh, so I got more to follow. I'm giving you a little bit of brush up on that uh, in the current environment. We're in uh, unclass here. Lieutenant. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, with the uh, current global supply chain uh, slowdown, as well as our dependence on Chinese made material, how do you see that, that affecting our ability to maintain our fleet and project our fleet forward in the future fight? Anybody want to go? Well, I'll take it. Uh, if nobody else wants it, I'll, I'll hop on it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a really good question. I think uh, General Smith talked to you about from the logistics piece. I think your, your question is more on overarching large supply chain and, uh, you know, fixing ships, buying Chinese-made products and those type things. Uh, you know, that's a fairly large question above the fleet side. I can give you my personal opinion, uh, which is that I think we're making pretty good strides in, uh, in finding where those weaknesses are, as you pointed out. Uh, half, of the, half of it is determine what the problem is, uh, and then we work to address that piece. Um, there's a cost piece um, that's involved in that, uh, but I, I, I think we're making better progress. I am concerned about it as you are, uh, but I, that's about all I can give you. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, this morning, at, uh, uh, Admiral Harris talked about CyberCop, and um, as we start looking at combatant commander support, uh, we, from the industry side, what are some of the things, and from a visibility, single pane of glass, that you're looking to uh, monitor in your CyberCop so we get a better understanding of what, what you're trying to uh, protect against? CyberCop. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned in the, in the previous question, uh, Vice Admiral Ross Myers, who is our 10th Fleet Commander, uh, also uh, uh, U.S. Navy uh, Cyber and Space. Uh, what he's doing, I don't want to speak for him, but having just come from, from Fort Meade in a previous assignment, uh, you know, he sees himself as the global indicator for Navy cyber protection. So he has cyber protection teams uh, based in fleet concentration areas, supporting not only the number of fleets, but also with our deploying strike groups and amphibious ready groups. Uh, we also, I, I believe the Marine Corps, Scurry, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the Marine Corps supported uh, the, the Queen Elizabeth deployment with a cyber protection team with the embarked F-35s on board. So, so he has largely taken that ex expeditionary mindset, concentrating his force, you know, training them, bringing them uh, up to date on the, the latest cyber threats, and then pushing them forward as needed with the deploying units and strike groups. At the same time, plugging in with the numbered fleet headquarters at their mock level with, with threats and, and areas that we need to look at, things that we need to harden, uh, patches that we need to put in place that are critical to the defense of our, of our C2 systems. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add if, uh, if this is helpful to you. Um, 
you know, cyber intelligence is important, an important art that hasn't, I don't think, uh, been uh, resourced appropriately. It's, it's still developing. Um, you know, a cyber cop would, would necessarily uh, focus on both defense and what we're doing offensively, but I'll go back to an earlier comment. I said, we, we, we can't do this as a, you know, U.S. cyber military only uh, view. We really de need to look out into uh, industry critical infrastructure. That may be precursors to attacks on military systems. Uh, that may be, you know, attacks on critical infrastructure could be what brings its nations to its knees and and military is the response to that. Um, those are not yet well integrated, and they need to be, and they need to be in short order. Hello, Mallory Shelbourne with USNI News. I wanted to follow up about the large-scale exercise. Um, you said that it was joint on the tactical level, and there was a lot of synchronization of fires. And um, I'm curious, from the numbered fleet perspective, what kind of capabilities would Project Overmatch bring to you that you don't currently have? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, completely joined at the tactical level. What's Overmatch going to bring to me? It's it's going to bring to me uh, the ability to move information uh, quickly, and what I'd expect out of it is uh, is further fidelity in my uh, in my long range fires and targeting in COP, in the ability for uh, distributed units. Um, to have visibility or or to see those particular um, uh, that that picture, uh, so I I think it's going to only enhance uh, from a distributed standpoint um, our warfighting capability, uh, and it's part of the overarching naval architecture that we have to enable all those fires and all that SA. And what I hope it brings is predictability. Um, using AI, machine learning, data analytics to provide me with uh, that predictability so that I can make risk decisions that will ensure that in times of uh, uh, unassured C2 that the, the units you know, in the field uh, deployed forward have the requisite understanding of, of, of the mission orders so they can execute effective mission command. And so that really drives back to, you know, how are we leveraging AI, machine learning, data analytics to prov provide us with that predictive analysis, whether it's uh, the, the composition of the water column, the atmospherics, the sea states, the, the ceilings and visibilities of the various airfields to make that, that, that predictive analysis to make those risk-based decisions so that when we push mission orders out to the field in times of, you know, challenging C2, that, that those commanders forward get, has a good understanding of intent to exercise sound mission command. I, I, that's, that's where I see us going, and that's what we're driving uh, at the number of feet level to achieve. We have time for two more questions, so we'll take you, sir, and then one last one. My, I'll make mine quick. This uh, question is coming from a former P3 guy for 2nd Fleet, 3rd Fleet, and PACT area. So we talked about the adversaries playing an away game, or we playing an away game, but our adversaries can play an away game too. So in general terms, you know, theater USW has always been a very, very challenging problem. We're looking at potentially going back to Cold War plus levels of activity, and threats can range anywhere from cyber to offensive mining and uh, threats to maritime shipping. Could you just in address in general terms any concerns you have about resourcing and training to potentially meet that threat in the future? Thanks. You want to go first? <laughs> yeah, so it's all about, you know, situational awareness, right? It's, it's our sensors, it's our uh, integration with allies and partners and using their unique capabilities. It, you know, uh, uh, as a naval aviator getting into the, the, the anti-submarine warfare field, I'm learning a lot. And what I, what I am learning first and foremost, it's, it's very difficult. It's very challenging. And, and the, people, the men and women who do that mission should be commended for the, their hard work uh, because it is a persistent proximate threat to the homeland when you have a, a submarine with land attack capability uh, um, unlocated. Uh, so it's about, it's about how are we posturing our, our, our future sensors? Uh, where are we placing them? 
uh, where are the investments in infrastructure to base our land base maritime patrol reconnaissance aircraft, and then what is the, the investment we're, we're placing in our surface force so they can, they can prosecute a, a submarine in, in any environment, which it can be very challenging, and, and that, that's where we need to focus our efforts. All right, one last one, sir. Sir, Admirals General, thank you for a great panel on operational stuff. Admiral Fogo, you mentioned the 1,700 plus ships the Chinese had, and I think the tyranny of distance, Admiral Kohler, you mentioned. Are we exercising our MARAD MSC and our capability that we have today, and are we defining the right demand signal for sea lift and support to maintain an ability to do distributed maritime ops and, and address the peer competitor threat? I'll hop on that one. Uh, first of all, I would say we are exercising uh, the MARAD, and uh, um, from a, we are exercising it from a exercise standpoint. Uh, and when we can execute it and work with uh, Admiral Wetlaufer, for instance, and execute it at some level, we are uh, working through that. And there was some work done, uh, even during large-scale exercise, um, with uh, with um, civilian shipping in an effort to do that. Uh, what we do see, as you mentioned, and as, as people have mentioned on the logistics side and as uh, General Smith mentioned, is, is that that whole specific chain continues to be um, very difficult. Uh, and I would argue that the exercising, and now I would say within command post exercise and those things, certainly continue to validate that. Uh, and there is a very large effort uh, across work with Admiral Wetlawford at MSC uh, work with uh, General Smith that he talks about uh, and the overarching MARAD and CIVMART to, to get after it, it is, it is, in the end, logistically supporting the away game is a hard fight, as you mentioned. All right, thank you very much. So that's, uh, that's it for our questions. One last comment for me, and that is I think the, uh, the group here has done an outstanding job of articulating for you the importance of the tri-service maritime collaboration, cooperation in national security for this country. And quite frankly, we need more of it. We need more Navy, Marine Corps. We need more Coast Guard. And last thought, we need to break the one-third, one-third, one-third paradigm and sweep some of those resources <laughs> this direction. I can say that because I'm retired now. Thank you very much. Bill. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Naval Institute and FCA International, please join me in a round of applause for our panel this afternoon. It's a great conversation. Job, guys. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give a copy of War Transformed, new Naval Institute book by Mick Ryan to each of our panel members. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. This one's yours, sir.